a simplistic way, how does probiotic bacteria play into this? Keep it all. Yeah, so the uh, question. The so question is do pro, how do probiotic bacteria play into the Yeah, so the story. idea is that, so the current uh, probiotics that are available have transient effects. So when you take a probiotic, you increase or decrease this community of good bacteria that is unable to compete with the bacteria that are normally present in your gut and do its good function. So the hope is that we'll be able to make more efficient or better probiotics by understanding what's going wrong in patients with type 1 diabetes. So I happen to have lived in Sweden for a few years and visited Finland. And I think most uh, dietitians would be thrilled for Americans to have the diet that you see in Sweden and Finland. It's much higher in fiber. Well, they do happen to drink a lot more, I will say that. Um, but what, it, what is going on with the, the diet? I don't understand. It's, it's contrary to, uh, it's certainly a much higher fiber diet uh, in Scandinavia. <laughs> Exactly here. I don't know what yeah, so they, there. Um, I mean, at least with Finland and Estonia, um, based on the data that they have shown me, the fiber intake is no different. Um, I mean, we began to look at, you know, I mean, we haven't finished all the analysis. The hope is by May 5th we'll have all the data, but the microbiome is very different. What, so, what, what, why is that? I mean, they, they have more fish. I yeah, so I mean, I mean, we'll have to make the connections, uh, but it's something that's very quantifiable. And the good part of the children's study is that we see it from month after month. So it's not something that happened in January, but that's not there in March. It's there all the way through. Do you have any um, explanation of the mechanism of how the changes in the microbiome um, so, um, I mean, we have some ideas. So in a mouse model, uh, investigators in Chicago have identified, identified factors that bacteria make that could tip the balance to get type 1 diabetes. So the, um, unfortunately, I mean, there are important studies to do, but they were done in mice. So the I mean, our, our thinking is, so one of the things that we did in a different study is we took 10 healthy individuals who live, live in California and looked at their microbiome every day. They were allowed to eat whatever they wanted. Uh, we uh, isolated the chemicals or the bioactives that are normally present in these healthy individuals, purified them, and have identified about 80 different compounds. Now, if you look at the distribution of these 80 different compounds in children with type 1 diabetes versus no type 1 diabetes, there's a huge difference. Some of these compounds educate how macrophages work, you know, uh, the innate immune system, how dendritic cells work. So, and what's also interesting is these same compounds are involved in how our brain works. So some of the neurochemicals that are in the brain you know, allow us to sleep, wake, think, um, not think, dream. Also, the same signals bacteria use to communicate with each other. So it's early days, but there is a lot of, um, um, so there's also another study done in Japan, where Kenya, Honda, and others identified certain bacterial products that educate regulatory T cells. And we know that regulatory T cells are a key determinant of whether you get type 1 diabetes or not. If, is there um, a definite cause or effect? Because, I mean, that's yeah, so that's what we're trying to get with this children's study, uh, where we can, so the problem is that all the microbiota studies in type 1 diabetes have come as snapshot studies, so a time point in time. But what this, uh, these children are going to allow us to do is to follow them when they're healthy, when they get type 1 diabetes, and so we have all the antibody markers, gene expression, uh, I mean, the whole spread. Uh, so I think, it, 
I mean, if there is a study that's going to answer this question, I think this is what it is. That's my question. When I listen to your speech, I'm thinking correlation. There's a correlation potentially between micro microbial flora in the gut and the onset of type 1 diabetes, but that doesn't imply cause and effect. Yes. And so right now, is it a correlation or have you a truly established cause and effect? So in, uh, in humans, not yet. Uh, but in mice, the answer is yes. Any questions for the other speakers? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you, actually. Does JDRF accumulate uh, demographic information on its members? For example, as I was listening, I was looking around the room, and everyone in the room, or at least that I can see from here, is white. Uh, I know that there's a lot more uh, diabetes in the Metro West area, so, so presumably JDRF has members from all around the country, and they compare it their own statistics with the general population to see if there's any kind of you know, trends or, or distinctions. It's not something JDRF can do on the JDRF membership, but we're supporting studies that are looking at these issues at the, through um, TrialNet and through TEDI, where we're looking at um, disease incidents in different populations, where we're looking at disease po uh, incidents in different ethnicities. There's a study that we know is coming out at the ADA meeting coming up in June on type 1 diabetes in the Chinese population in China. So we're very interested in trying to understand that, understand the genetics understand some of these epiphenomena that may be contributing to the incidence of, of type 1, but it's not something we can do on a JDRF associated families per se, because we just don't have clinical information or um, really access to that sort of information when you sign up for your JDRF chapter. But type 1 diabetes exchange, which I alluded to, is actually starting to accumulate that kind of data on people who opt in to making their clinical data available. Yeah. Exactly right, and the straightforward answer is we don't completely understand why those cells aren't infiltrating the islet and killing beta cells at this moment. It could be a combination of factors. One is the appropriate communication between those mouse beta cells in that experiment and the human beta cells is not appropriate. So we're taking steps to try and push that further. We're also trying to add aspects of inflammation back into that. If we inflame that islet, can we then trigger that immune cell? And we're actually looking at aspects of microbiome. Remember, these mice were severely immunodeficient. So they had no microbiome, basically. There's not much. So we're current, now doing studies where we add back different forms of bacteria into these animals and do these same experiments to see if we can actually promote that attack. Because these guys are usually on chronic antibiotic treatment. So we're removing that, adding back bacteria, and again, asking that question, and maybe providing direct evidence that the microbiome may actually induce autoimmune cell and beta cells. So it's, it's one of those factors. We just don't, what, don't know what's one yet. I think the key experiments would be once we actually create beta cells, immune cells, and finally get the feeling off from a diabetic donor, put them into the mice. That would, that would be the true communication. Now, I think the other thing to remember is that what we're learning about studying human pancreata is that the infiltration we're used to seeing in the NOD mouse model is not what we necessarily see in the human setting. So some of our expectations about what we should see in terms of recapitulating the disease may be more based on what we understand about the NOD immunobiology than it is human type 1. Yeah. Right, it, it, what, 
once Ray Bradford should see human cells meaning the destruction of, of the beta cells or of mouse or human origin. Those are the kind of experiments we're definitely Question back here? Uh, yeah. I'm not going to make this clear, but you know, um, you said that would stress be a factor when you're, when you're studying mice and, and humans. Uh, mice don't have the same kind of stress factors humans do. And doesn't stress affect us then as it does affect the livelihood of, uh, of insulin being produced or not insulin? Uh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, it's interesting, I'll be just off the yeah. Yes. <laughs> triggering the immune response releasing the inflammatory stimuli. Yeah, definitely. But I would actually argue that these mice might be even more stressed than we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mice in his lab are very stressed. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're being handled, they're being manipulated. So there, there is actually a fair amount of stress. Probably a different kind uh, of stress overall. But yeah, it, basically these models will never be a human. And so that we always have to remind ourselves of but what we hope is that the data we can glean from these studies will at least point us in the right direction, maybe reveal new pathways that can be targeted. But I, I think you're perfectly accurate as well. It, the environments are completely different. These mice live in little cages, and they have a very unified diet. But they'll never be the complete human model. We sort of can use them to answer specific questions. To push it forward. We can take one more question. So. You already got one. It's really good. <laughs> Sorry. Right. This one is for Dr. Carr. Um, have you, if you're looking for convection, they can put all kinds of things inside of blood vessels, and you've got a perfect pump to pump things across um, cells. Has that been given any consideration? Right. So um, we're currently kind of iterating a number of ideas to try to figure out the best way to add convection to the system. As you can imagine, it can be quite complicated. <clears throat> and there's a number of different approaches that we you know, could, could consider. Um, we are thinking that uh, a sub-Q transplant would probably be the best model versus peritoneal placement of a device, for example. And we're thinking that the convective mechanism should be within that sub-Q environment. So we haven't thought too much about putting it into a blood vessel. Um, there have been some strategies where um, blood has been, so devices have been connected to blood vessels, and the challenge there is that often they clot, um, and it's really difficult to, um, to, to prevent that. So we think having the convective um, part of the device uh, in the sub compartment outside of the blood vessels is probably the best place to, to put it. Thank you.